Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. So glad that you all could make it. As some of you are starting to come into the webinar meeting room, um, I just wanted to go over a few things before we begin. Uh, first off, we are recording this entire session. Uh, so if you do miss anything, you will be able to view it tomorrow. I will be sending everyone an email uh, with the full recording and PowerPoint, as well as any resources that we're going to be covering today. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alexandra Alvarado. I'm the Director of Marketing and Education here at the American Apartment Owners Association. Most of the time we have guest speakers come on and speak, but today I will be the one presenting on this topic. Uh, we've talked about it before, but I think there are definitely some useful updates to refresh you on. Uh, it's been quite a few years since I've done this particular presentation, uh, but I do believe that interviewing tenants is one of the most crucial aspects of your whole rental business, really. I mean, it can make or break what you do if you are renting to the wrong tenants. And that really all starts with the interview process. So we're going to cover that pretty in depth today uh, for about 45 minutes. And then we'll have some Q&A session uh, time available after that. Uh, I will be sending the video recording to this. Uh, Jane, thanks for asking. Um, and also the PowerPoint slides for you to review later and any resources. So please, when you have questions, put them in the question box so that we can address those um, as they come in. It'll make it a lot easier for me. I'm a solo team today to go through those questions if they're in the question box uh, rather than the chat. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and start with a, a quick thing here, a door spot which is an excellent property management software, is sponsoring this webinar today. And I'd like to show you one of their videos about their newest features. This will only be about 90 seconds or so. Uh, take a look here. I know a lot of you may already have property management software. Maybe you're searching for a good solution. They have a very comprehensive um, property management software. So I'm gonna go ahead and share that with you just a moment. Okay, so let's hit play here. DoorSpot for landlords. Our platform includes financial tracking, maintenance coordination, background checks, and tenant communications. Experience a user-friendly interface with innovative tools that sets DoorSpot apart. Simple pricing, all-inclusive features, and no hidden fees. At DoorSpot, your solution for property management, we are always innovating. Here are some of the new features we are releasing. Introducing our new split payment option, a flexible way for tenants to manage their rent payments. Landlords receive immediate payouts, ensuring a steady cash flow without delay. Tenants can choose flexible payment plans throughout the month, making rent payments more manageable. We've now integrated with Latchell's nationwide maintenance network for seamless service across the country, access a vast network of vendors, and enjoy truly hands-free maintenance management. Or let Latchell oversee your maintenance projects, providing a hassle-free experience. Discover our new advanced search and filter options designed for quick and efficient access. Find tenants, units, vendors, and more from anywhere with a few clicks. Utilize new filter options for better management of your properties and units. Management and scheduling of short-term and medium-term rentals. With our new scheduling tools, you can easily manage short-term and medium-term rental availability. Explore improved scheduling and availability features tailored to your customers' rental needs. Try it for free. Take advantage of DoorSpot's powerful property management tools today. Call for a demo and get a 20% discount by mentioning this webinar when you sign up for DoorSpot. Don't miss out. DoorSpot.com. All right. So um, if you all are interested in DoorSpot, I'll have an opportunity at the end of the webinar for you to opt in to their 20% off for their first year. It is fairly affordable and it's based on how many units you own or manage. So I'll talk about that at the end of the presentation. Thank you for sticking around for that. So now we are ready to get started. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here, just a second. All right, let's see here.
All right, it looks like it's not sharing the correct screen. So give me just a moment here to get this right for you. Here we go. All right, so give me a thumbs up in the chat if you can see the presentation. Uh, I much appreciate it if you can let me know that you can see and hear everything okay. Um, so we're really going to go through, thanks, Lisa. We're going to go through here the how to interview potential tenants. Um, first of all, got to give you the old disclaimer. This information is not going to be legal advice. I'm providing this information for your consideration as best practices for housing providers. It's really for educational purposes only. And if you do have a question about a specific resident or situation, of course, talk to an attorney um, and follow your policies. If I say something that differs, only implement that change upon approval. Um, so today we're going to go over a quick fair housing recap. Uh, we're going to talk about how to create screening criteria to help you filter out applicants that you talk to. And also we're going to talk about questions to avoid, those that you should be asking, and the answers that you should consider giving for some of these uh, tricky questions that tenants may try to throw at your way. And also some tips and red flags to look out for during the process. And then we'll finish up with some Q&A at the end. All right, so let's go over a quick fair housing recap. Um, so fair housing is nationwide, but then there are also additional state requirements that may apply. This is especially true if any of you are landlords in California or New York or Chicago. Um, there are a lot of different laws in these cities and states that go on top of and above and beyond fair housing nationally. Uh, but today we're going to talk at least at the federal level, and then I will call out some places in which you know you may want to consider going with something that is going to be um, maybe a little more on the safe side, just in case that may apply in your state. But I do encourage you to look up your specific state laws. Um, I'll send you all a resource with some of the fair housing laws in every state after this. Also, uh, we're going to talk about some protected classes. So these are the ones that are federally protected. Um, race, national origin, so where the person was born, skin color, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. So when we're talking about this whole interview process, we're really looking at not touching on any of these protected classes, trying to stay as neutral as possible with all of the tenants that you speak to so that nothing is implied. Okay, quick fair housing recap. Again, um, for those of you who don't know, hopefully you haven't been sued by a tenant, but uh, it is actually fairly easy for a tenant to file a fair housing complaint against you. This is why this is so important to know as part of your process when you're interviewing tenants. All they need to do is show that they are from one of those protected classes that I showed you and that they were qualified for your rental, then that you declined them and that the unit was available. That's it. So with only those four pieces of information, they can file a housing complaint. And whether it's legitimate or not, it will cost you uh, or your insurance money and your rates may even go up as part of this sort of fair housing complaint. Again, even if it's not legitimate. I know it sounds unfair, but it's definitely something that is a reality that we have to look out for. And it makes this really crucial in, in your rental business. Um, and the better you can stay away from someone filing a fair housing complaint, the more preventative you can be, the better. So a lot of times people will ask, okay, where does the fair housing process even start? Um, really, it's Throughout this entire uh, process, it starts with the listing. As soon as you put that vacancy up on uh, Zillow, Craigslist, apartments.com, you're already now open and vulnerable to a fair housing complaint. So what you say in that listing is really the first time that you really have to start thinking about fair housing. Then the first call and showing, they may be one and the same, right? If you have like an open house, for example, they may not call you, they may just show up. But regardless, the first interaction with that applicant and then providing them the application how you approve or deny them, and then finally providing them with a lease agreement. All of those parts of the process do involve fair housing considerations. So we're gonna go through the first uh, four here for you to consider throughout your process. All right, stage one, listing and screening criteria. So 
why is it important to tell applicants before they apply what your criteria is? Well, it does save time, helps you make more fair decisions. So you stay objective essentially, and it reduces liability. So ultimately having a criteria list before you even put the listing up on Zillow or apartments.com is something you should consider. And if you have a property manager doing it for you, then you should also go over these things with them as well. That way you're comparing apples to apples when you do get applicants. And you're also showing in a very verifiable way that you are treating all applicants in the same way. So if there's ever a complaint filed against you, you can show that you do have very clear cut criteria and that you list it and disclose it to all of your applicants. So what are some ways to set that SMART criteria? So here are some examples. So one is that the applicant has verifiable monthly income that is three times the monthly rent. I said three times here. That may not be realistic in your rental market with the way that rent and inflation has gone up higher than and faster than work wages. Um, it may be closer to two and a half in your area now, sometimes even two, but it really comes down to what you're comfortable with and what is considered normal in your area. This is a very common type of criteria that landlords will use. You can also um, put that the applicant does not have any considerable outstanding debts or rent related collections. So when you get the credit report, this is going to be on there. Okay. It's going to let you know if there are any debts owed to a pre previous property management company or landlord, or if they just have so much debt that it makes it difficult for them to pay rent. Um, so that could be another criteria there that's going to really impact their ability to pay rent. And then also that they demonstrate financial responsibility. You can be a little more specific. For example, you could say something like on-time payments uh, in the last six months on all open accounts. Again, that comes back to the credit report that the applicant has not been sued by the landlord. So this one's interesting because the credit bureaus actually removed civil judgments and lawsuits from credit reports in 2017. And I think a lot of you on the call still don't know this, and I keep saying it over and over again because I know there are still people who don't know it, um, but you do need to be ordering a separate search when you're screening your tenants. So whether you use us for screening or a different screening provider, um, we certainly do have an add-on uh, an add-on product that is going to include those tax liens and civil judgments, which were removed from credit reports in 2017. So I highly encourage you to make sure you are getting that as part of your tenant screening report, because that is a potential piece of criteria, right, that you may want to have, and you certainly um, could make a decision based on that. Also, that the applicant does not have a history of evictions. Uh, so this could vary for you. Maybe you're okay with an eviction that happened six years ago, but not one that happened in the last five years. You could set a time frame for those types of evictions if that is something that you know does matter to you. And I know that for a lot of you, it does. Um, also, that the applicant does not have a history of lease violations or noise complaints. That comes down to calling up a previous landlord and verifying it. Uh, typically, unless there's you know a lawsuit out against them for this reason, you're not going to see it in public record. So that's why it is also very important for you to contact landlord references. And also, when you're doing that, realizing that uh, you know, asking a previous landlord if they would rent to them again. I know some of you say the landlord could just be lying, but why not ask, right? It doesn't hurt to ask. Um, and also going back maybe to, to the two previous landlords, not just the most previous one, to really get down to the bottom of it. Also, that they didn't falsify any application information. You will know this typically when you get back either government-issued ID that looks a little funny, or maybe the report itself will indicate that the social security number is unknown or unverifiable. Uh, also, the applicant did not cause any damage exceeding the security deposit. This could be in a civil judgment, or it could be just a landlord references. We all know a lot of landlords don't take tenants to court for this reason. It might be more hassle than it's worth, so you might have to just ask the previous landlord to get that information. 
Um, and you want to make sure that they are able to provide you with government issued ID and income verification. Uh, that is something that if they can't provide you with is a valid reason for you to decline them. And when I say government issued ID, um, it doesn't necessarily have to be a social, but really any kind of identification that is official is something that you can use. And then also income verification can be for any kind of income. And we'll go over that later. Again, these are just examples. You don't have to use all of these, but really just, I just wanna present them to you so you start to think about this before you're putting up your listings. Um, and maybe if you already have criteria, you're tweaking it a little bit or maybe adding some things to it that might help you really hone in on those tenants that you do wanna to rent to, right? Okay, a couple other uh, best practices here. So. I would avoid including criteria related to criminal records. So the reason for this isn't necessarily that it's uh, fully spelled out legally, but HUD does recommend not having a blanket policy is what they call it, uh, meaning that you are individually um, analyzing and assessing each person as they come in when it comes to criminal. And so for that reason, I would not recommend saying anything like no felons allowed or um, you know, we don't accept anyone with a criminal record history, that might not be a great idea. What you can say is that you are going to be running a criminal background check. That is totally fine if you want to just let them know. But I would stay away from excluding them completely off the bat. There are also some cities and states that lately have introduced um, some laws to protect people with criminal records where you're not even allowed to um, ask them or talk about it or put it on the application until you've actually ran the background check. So make sure you check your local laws with that as well. If it is part of your application for some reason, you may want to remove it there too. Also, you can request uh, but do not require the SSN. I say this because there are some states where you're not allowed to require the SSN, like California, for example, um, but you can still ask for it. So that's a common misconception. Uh, they can provide it to you. You can ask for it. But if they don't, that shouldn't be a reason that you're declining them. And then also uh, considering all types of income, not just employment, again, law in some places, but not in all. However, I do think income in itself is is income, right? Whether it's coming from uh, a child support payment or a government subsidy or maybe a, a side job that they have. I mean, it, it is all income ultimately. So as long as you can verify it, I do recommend having you consider it. And then also uh, not making any one-off exceptions but that does mean that you can set additional requirements if they don't meet your criteria, right? So part of your criteria can also be, okay, if you don't meet this criteria, then I need you to either get lease guarantee, which is a product that AAOA offers uh, that pretty much covers you in case the tenant later ends up you know, not paying rent or leaving damages. Um, you may require them to get a guarantor or a co-signer or to provide you with additional documentation. If normally you don't ask for a W-2 or bank statements, maybe that's something that you might need to see that they have a healthy checking and savings and a long history with the job uh, or with the income that they are currently reporting. And also potentially higher security deposit up to the limit in your state. Um, so there's certainly you know, many different ways that you can go about uh, with your screening criteria. Uh, Paul asked here in the chat if I'll send this deck out as well. I certainly will, along with notes. So basically, you'll have all of this plus uh, some of the highlights of what I'm speaking about. Uh, ben also asked, if we don't have a social security number, how do you run the credit and background check? Great question. So we can do a credit check with an ITIN, which is an individual taxpayer identification number. It's the same number of digits as a social, and that's issued to people before they get a social. So we could use that instead. If they don't have either of those, then uh, we would not be able to pull credit, but we could still do the background check based on name and date of birth and a current address. So you'll see when you place an order with us, if you do mark SSN as unknown, it will ask for an address instead, and we'll use that. Um, Nora asking, is it okay to request pay stubs and bake statements even if they meet the criteria? 
Absolutely. So you can make that part of your standard criteria for everyone if you want. I do see that a lot of landlords are increasing the number of documentations uh, or documents that they are uh, asking of the applicants. And that's totally fine. You know, we live in a world where we are seeing more tenant fraud than ever. And it is important to make sure that you can really verify that they truly have money in the bank and that they are actually making uh, what they say they are. So I do think pay stubs for sure. Bank statements, not a bad idea. Uh, Kevin, California just reduced the limit on security deposits to one month of rent. Yep, that is going into effect in July. So uh, certainly this may not be an option for you uh, anymore in California to ask for a higher security deposit. Um, but, you know, if you are in a state where you can ask for a little bit more for a higher risk tenant, that's certainly something you can consider. Okay, let's move on here. All right, let's go to the first call. So let's say you have an interested applicant and they call you. That might be something that you may or may not do anymore. I know a lot of you all operate on email sometimes instead, uh, but if you did share your phone number and you get a call from an interested applicant, um, you can ask pre-screening questions, but uh, you do need to be a little careful with what you are asking on that first call. Make sure that you're discussing that standard criteria that you've put together. You want to make sure that you're telling every applicant the same thing. So that means not saying something extra, also not omitting something, right? Omitting can also be seen as a form of discrimination if you don't mention something. Make sure if you have property managers or agents that are calling on your behalf, that they are also pretty much following the same script. And make sure that you're not making a decision or implying pre-approval or declination, saying something like, ah, you know, no, don't even bother applying. You're probably not going to qualify. That's, even if it's true, that can be definitely be seen as discriminatory. You don't want to tell them either that they are for sure going to get it because then if they don't, they may be upset. And who is probably going to sue you? People who are upset. So just make sure you stay extremely neutral when it comes to talking to them. You're really just discussing the facts about the rental and your standard criteria, and you're telling them all the same thing. Make sure you're noting that date, the time of the call, and you're writing notes. I know you may think that you'll remember what you said and what was discussed and what they said and when they called, but that can easily get lost. And if something were to occur, like a fair housing complaint, you want to make sure that you have detailed logs of all that. That's going to show the judge that you are consistent in keeping record of everything. Uh, here's a first call example. So you'll need to submit a rental application and authorize a credit and background check. The application fee is $49 or fill in the blank. I'll need first and last month's rent up front. Or if you're in California, that might be different. I'll also need references from your prior landlords. You should also know that I will need to verify income and whoever is paying or living in the apartment will also need to be on the application and lease. So these are uh, some things that are good to mention. One, they need to be aware that you're gonna do your homework, right? So that that'll automatically weed out some people who don't want you looking into their background and credit check. Also, whether or not they want to pay the fee, right? So some of you, sometimes I know that you cover the fee. Um, it is nice to have the tenant do it just because it gives them some skin in the game and it really shows that they are serious. And then if you do approve them, you can always refund the application fee. Uh, the idea is really just for them to show that they are interested and serious about the rental. And then also uh, that you're going to verify the income and the landlord references and that you're going to be putting everyone on the lease. That's important too, just because you want to make sure that you have all of the parties that will be living in the property documented. And also if they are signing the lease, it does help later. If something were to go wrong, you have more parties to go after for any sort of lost rent or damages, for example. Okay, stage two, showing. So this is if you meet them in person. Now, I know these two might be one and the same, right? They may not call you. So you might have had that conversation in person, um, or you might maybe have a virtual showing. I know it can vary a lot between stage one and two, but I'm just going to go over in general, what are some things that you shouldn't ask when you are meeting that individual? So where do you work? Um this one is actually interesting because I know that uh, them having a job might be very important to you. 
Um, but this does make the applicant think that they do need to be employed for tenancy, and it would force people with disabilities to disclose that to you. And really, what you want to do is let the applicants provide that information on the application. Um, in a lot of states, you just can't discriminate based on that source of income. Now, if you're in your state that is okay, then it should be a fine question, but uh, just to be on the safe side, I think having the application filled out with that information is the best way to gather their employment. Also, do you have children? How old are they? So note that really um, children here is the problematic word. We know familial status is a protected class. And so you don't want to imply that if they tell you that they have more children than you, you know, find to be optimal, that that would be a reason for you to decline them. And also how old are they? Now, this is again, something that's just gonna be collected on the rental application. Um, and it's just better to have the rental application collect this information for you. Really the only exception to this would be if you have federal, you know, subsidized housing that requires this or a senior living kind of a situation where the age does matter or you can't have children on a senior property. Um, are you single or married? Uh, this goes to familial status as well. Same thing with sex here. If your uh, partner is, you and your partner are gay, not a question that's really relevant. Uh, do you attend church? There's one nearby. Uh, this infringes on religion. And so again, even if they want to talk to you about it, I would stay pretty neutral about it and not mention, you know, any sort of religious affiliation that you have or any reason that you would maybe sway them to want to move in or not uh, based on the church location. Uh, what's your accent? Uh, this does go into national origin. So definitely not something you want to bring up uh, unless they bring it to you and they mention that they're moving from, you know, somewhere uh, out of the country. That's fine. But it's certainly not something that you should be the first to bring up. Uh, do you have blank disability? Uh, again, another thing that really you want to ask them, not in this way, and I'll show you a different way that you can ask about disability, where it's not going to um, make you in, it's not going to put you in a vulnerable position where you're assuming that they have a disability that they don't, um, and then maybe changing the conversation due to that. So make sure that these are some of the questions you avoid. Um, but again, rephrasing them so that they might be a little bit more fair housing friendly. All right, what you should ask, obviously their full names. When do you need the unit? How many bedrooms and bathrooms do you want? What amenities do you want? Uh, do you prefer upstairs or downstairs? So again, if someone does have a disability, when you ask these questions, they're going to tell you, uh, you know, I need to live on the first floor because I can't walk upstairs or something of that nature. Or, um, you know, we want a pool and a park because we have children. Okay. You see, you're not the one to initiate the question, uh, but these questions do bring that information out if it is something that they need to tell you. Also, how many people will be living in the unit, not children? So really this is neutral. It doesn't mean that you are against having children. It's just that you need to know the number of human bodies that will be in the rental so that you can determine uh, legally if that's something that, you know, by occupancy standards would make sense. And also, uh, can you pay that application fee, the security deposit, and agree to a credit and background check? Eight, why are you leaving your current residence? So here they might start talking about maybe a job. Maybe they switched to a different company. They want to be closer to work. Um, maybe it's that they, uh, you know, need to move because uh, the place they lived in before was too small. So knowing the reason is really something else that can really unearth some more information and also make you feel more comfortable about the reason. Also, what is your monthly income? So again, income, just general and total, right? So what is the total monthly income? Can you pay for the move-in costs? 
Uh, do you have pets? This would be relevant if you have a no pet policy, um, or even if you do, you just want to know if you should be expecting pets or how many. Now, this isn't emotional. This is not emotional support animals, right? You're not asking them that. Uh, that is certainly something that they should be bringing to you if they do have an emotional support animal request, and that is separate. Okay, so when we say pets, we do not mean emotional support animals. Do you smoke? Smoking is not a protected class, okay? Uh, it, even if they're smoking marijuana for a health issue, that is still something that you do not need to accept in your rental unit. You can have a no smoking policy. Um, in fact, I, I encourage you to if you don't already, and it is a question that you can ask applicants. Are you planning on staying long-term? And so this just gives you an idea of what to expect with the applicant. Um, it's not necessarily infringing on any protected class. Uh, do you have questions? So this can be very revealing as to what they're looking for, right? If they start asking you questions about rules, uh, occupancy, you kind of get an idea that that matters to them. Um, sometimes they might reveal more to you than uh, through questions, really, than, than you have asked. And also, uh, are there any specific needs or accommodate accommodations that you require? This lets them know that you are open to helping them out if they do have a disability, if they do have a accommodation need for children that they might have. It allows them to then explain to you and request what they need. An emotional support animal is a common one nowadays as well. All right, I'm gonna pause here to see uh, what questions we have in here. Uh, so looks like Chris, uh, are we getting the slides? Yes, we are. I will be sending you the slides tomorrow. Uh, let's see here. Would the landlord have to return deposit that exceeds one month? Does the one month rent include pet deposits? So Sherry, if you are in California, it is one month is starting in July and you do have to return a deposit um, but it can include, I mean, you could call it a pet deposit, but it, it all total has to be one month. So whether you call it a pet deposit or a regular security deposit, it, it all has to equal one month anyway. So there's almost no point in differentiating part of the deposit to be used for pets. Okay. Didier, uh, I recently attempted to purchase a screening with AAOA, which package does not require the SSN. So any one of our packages does not require it. You can just simply mark that you do not have it. Um, and then instead, we will collect the uh, tenant's address. Uh, but that may limit getting the credit report, right? So we do have a package that's called um, the basic background that would not have a credit report in it, and it is $20. So you could order that if you uh, don't have an ITIN number either. Okay. Uh, Nora, I have a no pets policy. A tenant that moved in said they had no pets, but then I found a cat in her window. And when I asked about it, she stated that the cat is for emotional support. Angry face. <laughs> can I ask for additional support or increased rent? Yes. So you can ask for documentation for an emotional support animal. I highly recommend that you think about this ahead of time and that you have a process in place for those emotional support animal requests. Typically a form could be useful, although they don't have to use your form uh, to submit a request, but it is helpful if you have one to provide them. And then also to just getting back to them in a timely manner. Um, we have a lot of web and resources about emotional support animals. I'd be happy to share that with you all so you can process those. Uh, but it is also a good idea if you have an attorney to go through the situation with them. Um, there are also companies that do help landlords with processing uh, pet and emotional support animal requests. And so that's something else you can consider. Uh, one of them is called, uh, I believe, our pet policy, and the other one is pet screening. So I definitely think that's something you could look at you cannot increase rent for an emotional support animal. You cannot increase the security deposit or any fees for an emotional support animal. Uh, Suniti, do the fair housing rules differ for single room rentals? So the fair housing rules, at least that I've stated so far, do not. Um, it is still going to apply to you. I would, though, check with an attorney because there may be local laws that might have something different in place. And so I would definitely see if there's any exceptions to that. 
Mary, how much should we charge for a dog or cat? Um, so this really, uh, you know, if it is a pet fee, right, and it's not an emotional support animal and they have not made a request for one, you can charge a fee. Um, I would say like normal average fees are going to be anywhere from $25 to $50 a month. But again, check with your attorney to make sure you are allowed to charge fees. I know there are some laws that have been proposed in several areas to eliminate pet fees altogether. And so you want to make sure that that is allowed if you are going to do it or if there maybe is a cap on it in your area. Okay, I'm going to pause there on some of those questions. Um, and... I will get back to you all soon. Uh, we'll keep this show on the road, uh, showing and answering questions. So some questions that you can ask, do you, do you or sorry, some ways that you can answer questions that are being asked. Um, so if they ask you, do you take children or uh, do you allow me to have, you know, my four children here? Um, or it might be that they don't want to live next door to, you know, a big family that has a lot of children. Um, so more commonly, so in California, for example, um, uh, only adult housing or saying that only adults are allowed has been basically illegal since 1982, unless it's senior housing. Uh, there are other states with similar laws as well. So the answer to this is, of course, uh, people of all ages are welcome here. Um, you know, that is really the most neutral way to say it. People of all ages are welcome. Again, unless it's senior living. Um, if they ask, are there many children living here? Uh, maybe they want to know if their kids are going to have friends to play with here, uh, but you don't necessarily want to provide information about other tenants and their familial status. So same response here. People of all ages are welcome here. Fair housing law doesn't permit us to track that information. Uh, and if you want to know if this is appropriate or not, fill in children with any other protected class. And it sounds kind of wrong if you ask it that way. Um, are the schools here any good? So, you know, thank you for asking, but I think you should check with the local school district for more information about that. The reason why is because you don't want to influence or discourage families with children uh, by stating your personal opinion on whether or not the schools are good. Let the facts speak for themselves. Okay, some more. Uh, what kind of people live here? It's a loaded question. Um, the response here that you can give is, we are an equal opportunity housing provider and everyone who meets our qualifications are welcome to live here. Is this property in a safe area or a high crime area? So this is uh, something else that you don't want to guarantee, right? You don't want to guarantee their safety, uh, but you also don't want to dissuade them from applying. So you want to maybe just tell them, similar to the school district, uh, check with your local, the local police department online to see what the crime rate is in this area. Could you show me an apartment next to or not next to another family, race, adults, et cetera? Um, this is known as steering. So uh, it is discriminatory to provide them with this. Just remind them that you do not track this information and neighbors may move at any time, uh, but you can disclose if the neighbors are smokers. So that is one exception where you could, if you do allow smoking, have separate sections. Um, but most of the time here, the answer is going to be the same as, as we started with, right? Everyone here is welcome. We don't track this type of information. Um, and if you want to know about the crime or the school districts, check in with them. All right. A couple else thing, a couple other things here about red flags uh, during this showing process. Make sure that they're the actual ones that are showing up, not their mom or dad or boyfriend or girlfriend. That is a red flag. It should be them, the person who is applying or the people who will be living there. Um, any overly negative comments about previous landlords can be a red, red flag, um, especially if, you know, we know not all landlords are great, but um, it's certainly you can sense a pattern of overly negative comments that might make you kind of feel that they would not do well with any landlord. Um, if they are in a big hurry, 
So they might be in a rush to rent your place because their eviction or court hearing uh, is coming up soon. And so they want to get into a new place before that goes into public record. And this is why it's important to talk to a previous landlord. Um, but that big hurry, that pressure that they give you, if that feels really uncomfortable, then it is typically a red flag. There might be a good reason, but... Um, Unless you can verify that reason, it's usually not a good sign. They are late or hard to coordinate with. Again, something that could indicate a bigger problem in the future when you're trying to coordinate things like maintenance. If they criticize the rental more than maybe they should, uh, that could also be a potential red flag. And asking suspicious questions, right? We said questions can say a lot. Um, if they're asking about overnight guests or about your emotional support animal pet policy, they probably have pets that they will likely put into emotional support. So these are all sort of red flags to sort of look out for. Um, and I think really, you know, it depends on your particular rental, but um, those are some things that I think are typically you know, generally going to be a red flag. So some tips, uh, still don't make a decision or imply one, even if they went and saw the unit with you. Always get a credit report and make sure you're showing them all the same thing. So every tenant is seeing and experiencing essentially the same tour. Now, if you do a self-guided tour option, so if you're a remote landlord and you have a lockbox, right, and we have smart sort of uh, showings here that they schedule, there are lots of apps out there that do that now, um, then in that case, you don't really have to worry about it, right? They're taking themselves on this tour. So, but if you're the one giving the tour, make sure that, or your property manager is, make sure that they're all doing the same process for everyone. And also another idea here, although it's not required by law, you can ask for or say that you know, the first come, first qualified, first serve. So um, if they call you and they are qualified and they want to come see the rental, um, certainly that's something you should schedule appropriately uh, and not deny to them or make, you know, a delay, I should say, that might be noticeable. Okay, stage three, the application. So you can give everyone an application. Um, even if you don't think they're going to qualify. So let's say you provide that criteria to them and, uh, you know, you're thinking, okay, they told me they don't even make enough money, but it's still something you should provide them, right? Let them make the decision as to whether or not they're going to apply. AEOA does have a free comprehensive application, which I'll share with you in a moment uh, where that is located if you want to use our application. Or in now we also have something called the Apply Now link, where you can create a link for your rental property that you can share with the applicant. Um, and that would allow them to online enter in all of their details. And so um, in any case, if you're just giving that application to everyone, that's going to be safer for you. Also, you want to note the date and time submitted. If it is being done online, then obviously that'll be recorded. But if you're doing it by hand, uh, make sure that you're putting that date and time. And avoid batching. Again, this isn't something you have to do by law, but batching is basically when you wait a week, right? And you get all the applications that came in and then you review them all at the same time. That can be a little tricky. Um, it, it's, it's not, like I said, illegal, but it is good to, as you receive them, review them and give them that opportunity. So the first person who's qualified uh, gets the rental. I know that might not be your ideal situation. I would check with the attorneys uh, that you work with to see what is the best way. The reason why I say this is just because it's easier to show that the reason you decline somebody isn't because of a fair housing reason or discrimination, but it's because they applied after somebody else who did qualify. Um, so those are just some things to keep a lookout for. And now I will take some questions. So I'm going to go ahead and stop the share here for a second. Uh, and I'm going to go through the Q&A box. So let's see here. 
Uh, Chris, should we have the applicant sign that they received a copy of the statement of the rental policy? So if you're talking about the screening criteria or any policies that you have, certainly not a bad idea. Um, I would check with your attorney if that's something you're allowed to do, but I'm pretty sure that it would be nice to have a sort of paper trail that they acknowledge that they saw and received the screening criteria. Jeff, um, where and how should we save this criteria? Can you send a sample? You're great. Much appreciated. Well, I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad you appreciate it. Um, so what I can do is send you the slides that have those criteria listed. Uh, I know that there are some associations I've seen that provide criteria like pre-made, but I do think that it is such a personal decision to make, right? You know your rentals, you know yourself, and you know the area that your rentals are located in and your comfort level with the risk. And so whatever you feel comfortable with might be completely different than another landlord, right? Uh, one landlord might be totally fine with a tenant who had an eviction five years ago and another doesn't want to ever see an eviction or a bankruptcy for that matter. That's another popular one. So I'll send you a list of those that, you know, you can consider, and then you can decide for yourself if that's how you want to handle those situations. Does the AAA report include evictions? Um, yes. So almost all of our reports do. We do have an exception to that. So um, our most basic package doesn't have a um, an eviction report. And the reason for that is some landlords, uh, believe it or not, do not want an eviction report, or maybe they might feel like it's not uh, necessary in their in their process. Uh, so we do offer that option, but for the most part, almost all the packages do include evictions. Um, Danielle, what can be asked to confirm household income is legally connected, like through a marriage, as friends living together aren't financially bound, so they pose a higher risk, uh, but likely don't all make two and a half times the rent. Um, so again, this is something you can decide for yourself. Um, if they're not married, they're basically going to be on both on the lease agreement, most likely. They're both equally liable. So you can put a clause in your lease agreement, you can work with your attorney on this, that might state um, something that would indicate like who is responsible, right, if the rent doesn't get paid. Typically, there will be a standard clause in there that will mean something like that they are all, um, you know, equally liable. Um, but uh, if you are qualifying them together, then, you know, you it, it isn't a bad idea to see, okay, if there's one person who, you know, doesn't qualify on their own, but the other person moves out, what's going to happen in that situation, right? So I would talk to your attorney about what the best way is to put that in a lease agreement so that you can actually enforce that if one of the tenants leaves or um, when you're creating the criteria as well, it could be maybe a different kind of criteria that you have for co-tenants, right? So it's not familial status because they're not married. Um, so they're just co-tenants. What's the situation and, and what, what would you do in that situation? And um, are you able to uh, ask for something different, right? And an attorney would definitely be able to help you out with that. Okay, what is acceptable income verification? Can't these be forged or fabricated? Um, that's from Chris. Absolutely, they can be. Unfortunately, um, this is usually the most fraudulent type of document that you're going to receive as a pay stub. Uh, they're not that hard to fake. Uh, even before, you know, AI, <laughs> people could just make up a pay stub in Microsoft Word if they wanted to or paint. Um, so it really doesn't take much. So what I suggest is having a few different types of documentation. The more you ask of a tenant, the less likely they're going to be to go through the trouble. So if they know that you're asking for a W-2 and a bank statement and pay stubs, and you're going to call the employer and verify the income, um, they're not going to want to deal with it, right? So if they see that, they're probably not even going to apply at that point if they see that criteria on your listing on Zillow, for example. Um, so I know it might sound like overkill. Some landlords don't like asking for all those documents. I get it. It's totally up to you if you're going to ask for it. Um, but it is, it is helpful. The more you have uh, to ask, the less likely they will be to fake all of those documents. Stephen, uh, why do property management companies require three times the contract rent as a policy or screening tool? Even someone making $6,000 a month is subject to job and family challenges. How is this practice in context with fair housing? 
Yeah. So three times the rent has been, I don't really know exactly where it came from, but it's been sort of the number that has been thrown around for years. And I think that it really needs to vary more on where the rental is located. Three times the rent isn't really realistic anymore. Um, I think we have some areas where it's closer to two and a half and it really just depends on also, um, you know, what you feel comfortable with. And it is true. If they do have any job or family ch challenges that might change that, it almost doesn't matter as much. Um, I think what matters in that case is that they have a good checking and savings account, which is why the bank statement is maybe something you might want to consider. Uh, do they have enough savings for that rainy day if that were to happen, right? Um, that certainly can help you make your decision. And you can have both the income qualification, but also making sure that they have maybe at least, um, you know, three times the rent in their bank account so that they can pull through a couple of months of being unemployed, if that's the case. And in practice of fair housing, it doesn't really um, touch that much on fair housing because it's not really uh, affecting a protected class in particular, um, unless there is maybe, um, for example, you, like I mentioned before, in California, you can't require that the income be only from employment. Um, so as long as it's you're just saying just the total income needs to be X amount, um, I really doesn't have much to do with the fair housing in that case. Uh, what's the normal deposit practice, Sam asks. Yeah, so normal deposits, typically it's gonna be one to two months rent and also a first month's rent upfront. Um, now in California, as we were mentioning before, it is a max of one month. Uh, so check your state, what, what max there is. A lot of states don't have a max. So it's really just, you know, obviously if you're going to ask for an absurd amount of security deposit, you're probably not going to get as many applicants. Um, but definitely check your local laws and find out what's reasonable for you. Um, at the end of the day, having that deposit is really nice when you need it uh, because if there are damages, you don't have to take the tenant to court. The problem is, is not that you wouldn't be able to do that, but it's just the process of going to court to get that money might not even be worth it. So if you already have that cash on hand and you can justify why you're not giving it back to them, it's better to be in that position, right? Um, now, if you go too high in states where you're allowed to, again, it might limit your applicants. So um, I would say two months if you can. Unfortunately, you can't anymore in California, uh, but definitely consider that. Also, uh, Veronica here saying, in California for Section 8 housing applicants, if your standard screening criteria requires a credit report to verify judgments, evictions, collections, is this an allowable reason? Our credit report is not credit score based. Um, so as far as I know, yes, um, that shouldn't be an issue. So you can typically have as much criteria as you have for any other applicant. Um, you don't have to make separate criteria for Section 8 in particular. Um, so I would definitely check with your attorney just in case, because we do always have exceptions in certain cities, even in California, Los Angeles and San Francisco being uh, Oakland, famously being uh, some of those that do have separate rules for those. Can you say uh, that qualifications are no bankruptcies, felonies, or evictions in the listing ad? So Van, I would say... Um, I would not include felonies as part of that. So HUD has issued some guidelines that do apply to all rental housing providers, no matter how big or small. And they say not to have a blanket policy. It's technically not law, but the HUD guidelines are taken very seriously. So um, I would say that Excluding that felonies would probably be the best way to go, no matter where you are. HUD does apply federally, um, so I would avoid putting that. But bankruptcies and evictions should be fine. Um, in New York City, there is a little bit of debate as to whether you can say evictions, uh, so I would check with that. But um, bankruptcies, for sure, you could say that, uh, and that is part of the credit report. Um, or you can order a separate bankruptcies uh, tax liens and judgments report from us if you need that info by itself. Uh, Joel, is there a maximum application fee that can be charged in California? There is. And that has gone up with inflation. I want to check and see what it is now. I believe it's like $56 or something, which is a lot more than what our, um, oh, $59. 
it's a lot more than what we charge for the screening package. But in California, you can only charge for the screening fee itself. And so whatever the cost is, you can't really go above that. There's some exceptions where you could maybe say that there's like an administration fee, um, but it is tough to prove, right? Um, and so I would stick to only charging what the cost of the report is. Maria, what about tenants with a voucher? There is, is it acceptable to use the apartment for businesses? Uh, or traffic into the house? When is the apartment residential? What are my rights? Um, so let's start with the first one, tenants with vouchers. So a tenant with a voucher, depending on what state they're coming in, where, where your rental is located, um, you do have to consider as income, just like you would any other kind of income. And I, I mentioned before, California is definitely one of those states. There are others as well. Um, but essentially, no matter where you are, it might be something you do want to consider because the money that comes in through the voucher program, it does sometimes put some more requirements on the landlord, but it is money that is guaranteed to come to you. And so uh, some landlords do actually prefer that because it's essentially guaranteed rent, especially if the voucher is for the entire amount or almost the entire amount of rent. Then, you know, no matter what happens with the tenant situation, you're going to get paid regardless. You just have to jump through a few additional hoops in terms of the program. And every city or county will have different requirements for their voucher program. They might come just to inspect the rental unit um, and have you fill out a little bit of paperwork. But um, certainly something that you should consider, even if you're not in a state where it requires you to. And also, um, is it acceptable to use the apartment for business use? So that's something that you can put in your lease. Um, I would definitely talk to an attorney about it. I know nowadays work from home side, you know, gig economy is very big. There are a lot of tenants that work from home. Um, having traffic though, from the outside in is not something that is necessarily something that you have to uh, allow. So just make sure however you're putting that, it, that you're doing it in the right way in the lease agreement. Um, and have an attorney maybe put a clause in there if you feel that that might be an issue. Okay, Beverly and Ian, I have not requested the social security number and we'll give them the link to AAOA's credit reports so they can pay for the report and submit their social security number. Is that a good practice? Um, yeah, absolutely. So you don't need to get the social security number from the tenant directly. If you do order a report through us and you don't provide the social, we will ask the tenant for the social for you. Um, and what's nice about that is it makes them feel a little more secure because they're not giving it to you. I mean, they don't really know you, right? So I, I do understand the hesitation on their end. Um, we do collect socials on your behalf. It is nice to have a social as well, just because it if later, you know, they skipped out and they moved out without paying rent or something like that, it does make it easier on the collection side if you know their social. But other than that, I mean, they can just provide it to us directly and then we can run the background and credit check. Okay. And Beverly also, uh, oh, I think I might have already answered that one. Van, uh, do you still have to send a letter to the tenant as to why their security deposit is not going to be returned once they have been evicted, especially when their unpaid rent and damages are higher than the security deposit? So in California, you certainly do, and actually in most states you do, have to give an itemized list as to what you are deducting from the security deposit. So if you've already had to make those changes or fixes and you have receipts, you can use receipts to justify it and back it up. Um, otherwise, if you don't have that work done yet, you can use an estimate from a contractor, for example, um, also an estimate for your time. It does need to be reasonable. So um, if the tenant does decide to take you to court because you didn't return the security deposit, make sure that you have enough evidence to back that up so that you can show the judge, hey, here's exactly why I took out this much from the security deposit. And it's totally reasonable, right? But it's really up to the judge to decide if that is reasonable ultimately, right? What is a reasonable cleaning fee, right? What is a reasonable amount for your time if you're the one who is cleaning or making those fixes? So it is a little subjective. And I would say, um, you know, the more clear you can be with the tenant, hopefully they'll understand, the less likely they'll be to take you to court. 
Uh, Sam, I buy a home warranty, which covers HVAC, water heater, garage doors, and all appliances. And I ask tenants to pay the $75 deductible for every claim. Is that okay? Um, I would check with an attorney first, Sam, and then also make sure that it's in your lease agreement. If the attorney can create a clause for you in the lease agreement, um, that might be okay if the tenant has already agreed to it. Um, it's not typically standard practice. Most of the time, landlords and property managers will be the one to do it. I know there are some laws where, um, for example, like if carpet is not old enough yet to be replaced um, and they damage it, then you can use that, let's say, um, in the security deposit deduction. Uh, but if the carpet is older than a certain you know, number of years, then even if they did damage it, you can no longer do that. So there are some exceptions depending on your area where you might not be able to deduct for certain things. I don't know about charging them for the home warranty fee if that is allowed. Um, again, I would check with an attorney in your area and if you if they do, you know, recommend it to have them write you a clause that it's in the lease agreement so that it's not a surprise for the tenants. Um, Nancy, can you go back uh, to showing tips I need beyond the first two points? Um, Nancy, I will be sending everyone the PowerPoint slides and the recording tomorrow, so you will be able to go back to that slide. Okay, Sam, can you please share a number if we can call for any quick questions? Um, so that is Great that you brought that up, Sam. I do want to show you all something very cool that I don't know that it, all of you know we have on our website, okay? But I highly encourage you to use it. We have a partner program with a legal chat. Um, so let me go ahead and share that screen here with you so you can see it. Um, this is so cool, guys. Um, if you click on solutions here in the menu of our website and you click on legal help, you see that there? Um, we have a chat with an attorney option. So if you ask a question here, an attorney will get back to you within 24 hours with an answer. You can ask as many questions as you want. It's $5 for a one week trial. And then after that, it's $53 a month, but you can cancel before your trial is up. I've used it myself. I have a commercial lease agreement and I was assigned an attorney who, um, oh, he was so sweet. He, he was recently retired and he just gave me so much information and it is all online. So they're not going to get on the phone with you. They're not going to go to court for you. They're just going to answer quick questions. I love this. And they also assign a attorney who is in next to your rental property. So you get to get somebody who actually knows your local laws really well. And I think, you know, most of them are just really, they're retired or they have some extra time and they just get online and they answer questions. And like I said, at least my experience, they were very, very thorough. So again, solutions tab and then legal help here. Uh, that's a great place to go to get your questions answered. All right, back to questions. Uh, Sam, oh, we answered that one. Rain, where on the AAOA website can I find the free application? Oh, well, let me stir my screen once again. Uh, if you go to our website under forms and then you click free, okay? So this, these are our list of free forms. The application to rent comprehensive is here on the left. So you can click that to get a free copy of the comprehensive. I do recommend the comprehensive because it's going to gather the information that you really need to, um, you know, in worst case scenario, if you have to sue a tenant later, you're going to have a lot of detail about them and references that you can check before you rent to them. All that stuff will be in it. So um, do recommend this form. Uh, these are all free as well. Move in, move out checklist is one of my favorites as well. So you have some record when you do finally move the tenant in. Uh, they basically sign off that, you know, where are the damages? And when you move out, you assess it again, take photos. All that stuff helps uh, when or if the tenant does dispute a security deposit. Um, also, we have a rental deposit form that you can use. So here are some free ones. We have some that are not free as well, but totally worth it. The commercial lease agreement obviously is one of the most popular. So I definitely recommend checking out um, the forms. They're pretty affordable if you do do um, the paid one. You do one month for $30, you get access to all the forms or a year for 60, 
Or if you click join and you join one of our membership options here, the pro or pro plus, it does include the forms automatically. Um, so definitely would recommend using those forms and then also uh, the legal chat here uh, for legal help, okay? All right, let's get back to some questions here. Um, Mark, do we have to put our rental criteria in the ad for the property or can we just explain it after they contact us? So this is totally up to you. You don't have to do that. Um, it just would maybe reduce the number of calls that you're getting from people who wouldn't qualify, right? So it's sort of up to you if you want them to sort of self-filter, then um, you may get fewer calls, but you may get more quality calls or you might just want to talk to everyone anyway. So it's really up to you. Okay. And let's see. Ian, can you repeat the, about the last question to ask at a showing something along the lines of, will you have any additional requirements or accommodations? You got that right, Ian. Um, any additional requirements or accommodations is a great question to ask so that they can let you know if they do have an accommodation that they need for a disability or uh, for anything else, really. And that helps you to not be the one to ask them first or assume anything. Uh, Nancy, can your potential tenants have them give you their work numbers so you can verify income? Of course, um, that is absolutely something we recommend. You should be calling their employer. Um, I would just Google the employer's name, to be honest, and then not even just use the number that they give you, but Google it, call them. Hey, can I talk to the HR department? Okay, great. I want to verify employment for a rental applicant. They're all going to tell you exactly how to do that. Some of them will say it right over the phone. Yes, they work here. Here's how much they make. Others will direct you to a third party that they might use if it's a bigger company and you have to pay a fee to that third party to get access to that information. And I say, always say this, it's totally worth it. If you can verify where they work and their income from a third party that's basically saying, yes, they, they do work here. Um, and here's the documentation. That's always going to be a safe way to really verify their income. Um, Beverly, I'm not in California. What organization would I check with to learn leasing requirements? So Beverly, one way to do that would be the legal chat that I just showed you all. HUD is great for federal. So um, that's going to give you the top federal um, sort of laws. There's, uh, you said Massachusetts, I think is, is where you guys are at. Um, certainly you can try some resources there, but really talking to an attorney in your area is going to make it a lot easier. I would say that would probably be the, the fastest way to kind of go back and forth with an attorney on a chat. Like, can I ask this? No. Okay. Can I ask this? And then you can kind of narrow it down with them. Um, let's see here, Van, if the tenant caused damages to your home and they have renter's insurance, will renter's insurance cover the damages? I thought that renter's insurance only covers the renter's personal belongings. That is correct. So renter's insurance, um, not only covers the renter's personal belongings, but it can also cover things like, um, damages to their property caused by, um, something other than themselves. So theft or, um, any sort of like uh, weather kind of issues. Also liability for dog bites can be part of uh, an insurance policy um, or slip and falls, guests that are in their rental unit who may become injured. Um, those are all things that the renter's insurance could cover. The lease guarantee, which we have on our site, um, when you screen a tenant with us, you do get the option to get a lease guarantee if they have a credit report. Um, that is something that's separate and it's something you can require the tenant to pay for or you can get it yourself. That would cover any sort of damages that are caused by the renter or any unpaid rent. And so you can think of that really as coverage for your lease agreement uh, versus renter's insurance is coverage for their property, their guests, but it helps you out because if they have renter's insurance that's going to reimburse them, they're going to be less likely to come to you for reimbursement, right? So always recommend requiring renter's insurance. If you're not doing it already, please, please start doing it because you will be very happy if something goes wrong, knowing that the renter has insurance that can cover it um, before it falls to you to do anything about it. 
Didi, how long do we keep the application? So we recommend uh, 24 months, so two years, even if you don't accept them into your rental. Keep them in a safe locked filing cabinet, have those rental applications in there, or if you have them on your computer, make sure they are password protected. Um, that way, you just in case something happens, again, even if you don't accept their application and rent to them and you have that information, um, that's always going to be something you can use later if you need to defend yourself. Nancy, but I thought you couldn't ask where they worked, but you're saying we can ask for employment numbers. Yeah, so verbally, I would not recommend it, but on the rental application, yes. Um, you can have a place on the rental application for them to state whether or not they have employment and whether or not, uh, and also what the contact information would be to do that reference. And then if they don't have employment, you should also have a space in the rental application that asks for other sources of income and that those you can verify as well. So if you're verifying uh, whether or not they have a social security payment coming to them, they can they should be able to show you a letter for that or child support, whatever it is that maybe the additional source of income is, um, you can ask for proof of that. But I do just recommend not saying it just because it would sort of not imply that you are requiring it necessarily. Uh, let the application do the information collecting for you, I say, and then verify whatever is on that application. That's going to be a safer way to go. Sam, should we make it compulsory for the tenant to get renter's insurance? Um, yes, I would recommend that. Uh, but again, check with your attorney to make sure you do that in the right way. Uh, certainly, though, I think if you can, you definitely should. Uh, Susan says, we require renter insurance for liability for pets and for a minimum of $500,000. That's amazing. Renter's insurance is actually relatively inexpensive. Even if you're asking for a super high policy amount like that, Susan, I bet you the cost to the tenant is probably under $30 a month. So um, you know, certainly something you can do. There's also something called a master's renter policy where if you have a big building of rental units, you can get a master rental policy and enroll all your tenants into it and then they pay you for the renter's uh, policy. So that's also something you can consider if you do have like a big building and you want everybody under the same exact plan. Um, okay. Sam, thank you. You're so, so nice. He's saying he's really enjoying and thanking me for what I do here. Thank you. Um, Sam, do I need a property inspection for the credit report? No. So if you don't want to get an inspection of your office, which old school, that's what used to be required, believe it or not, to get a credit report. Nowadays, you can just um, get the tenant's email. The tenant would get an email where they have to say, uh, yes, I agree for my future landlord, Sam, to view my credit report and they answer a few questions and then you get the report results. Now, we still have the option to do the inspection if you want. So what happens when you get the inspection of your office is that you no longer have to provide the tenant's email. You would, though, need to provide their date of birth, social and address instead, and then you would get the results right away. If you do want to set that up through us, you can. Um, you would need to just create an account or you can give us a call and then we'll have an inspector come out and get you set up that way. Um, totally optional, like I said, most people will just provide the tenant's email so they avoid having to do the inspection. All right, um, Mr. Liu, if the renter does not have renter's insurance and there is a slab leak that requires the shutoff of water to the house for several days, does the landlord have to pay for their stay at a hotel or motel if they don't have any friends or relatives to stay with? Um, typically, yeah, um, you would have to cover their costs for the time that the unit is uninhabitable or um, maybe decrease their rent for that month. Um, that is something that you can discuss with an attorney if it's something that you're going through right now as to how to best handle and notify the tenant of that. Um, but certainly, you know, it's not their fault. And so um, it is something that, you know, they're not able to get from you during those days, right? They don't have housing during those days, so they should be compensated. Van, I don't require renter's insurance because I have general liability insurance to protect me uh, should the renter or the guests get hurt. Uh, should I still require renter's insurance or is that overkill, especially when that's another added expense to the tenant? So I understand um, if you do have general liability, that's always a good thing, but you don't want to use your insurance policy if you don't have to. Okay. Every time you use your insurance policy, your rates are going to go up inevitably. The ideal situation would be to have both so that the tenant, let's say worst case scenario, uh, you know, 
it's a hundred thousand dollars and they get reimbursed by their renter's insurance. Your insurance isn't touched at all. Um, or maybe it's a $50,000 policy and the damages or what they need is a hundred thousand. So then your insurance covers half, theirs covers half. In the end, at the end of the day, really, you want to have as many barriers to you and your insurance as possible. And so one way to do that is to have renter's insurance. And I definitely think it's worth it. The cheapest renter's insurance policies I've seen um, cover like 15 to 20,000. Those are still only $10 a month. I know it is an additional fee to the tenant, but if you don't want to charge it as a fee, just increase your rental rates by $10. You know, like just think of that as just another layer that you're putting in there. And trust me, it will be worth it if you ever have to use it. Didi, what can I do if the tenant refuses to send renter's insurance? Well, you cannot rent to them. I wouldn't give them the keys unless you can verify that they have it. And also uh, you may want to require being listed as a party on their renter's insurance. So you get notified if they do cancel it at any time. Um, but certainly that can be a requirement you know, put it in your criteria, let, let the tenants know this is something you will have to uh, do to rent here. And, uh, they'll, they'll do it if they want the place. Can you direct us to any rental insurance link on your website? So, um, we are currently working on a partnership with a rental insurance company. So right now I don't have one to share with you, but we will be announcing it soon. Uh, you all, as usual, are the first ones to know when I, we get on these webinars, these questions inevitably come up. Um, I'm very excited to have a partner that will be able to provide renter's insurance after a tenant applies and you screen them where you'll be able to just simply, you know, click a button to send off a request to the tenant to purchase renter's insurance through our new partner. So stay tuned for that. Um, I think within the next 90 days, we're going to have something like that for you. Uh, Van, what should the minimum dollar amount be on the renter's insurance policy? Totally up to you what you want to require. Um, like I said, just look at also like what's reasonable in your area. So the rates do vary by zip code. Um, you might want to do a little research into that and see, because you don't want the tenant to have to pay too much more, right? Um, also too, like what kind of rental unit is it and how bad could the damages possibly be or how much property could they possibly have? You can also give the tenant the option. So if they want to get more for their own benefit, then, you know, certainly offer that, um, you know, some tenants will pay more for renter's insurance just to have their own belongings um, more covered. Okay, so I'm going to go through the chat now because we've gone through uh, the Q&A questions. And I know we are way over on time. Again, if you do have to go, I understand we are recording this. So you will get a copy of this uh, tomorrow, not to worry. Okay, let's see here. Okay. Paul says, that's why I only do email communications up to the lease draft. That's not a bad idea. If you want to keep things into written form only, that is your decision. It's nice to have. I will say um, when you have something written versus verbally spoken, it's, you know, irrefutable. So not a bad idea. Uh, Shirley, what if uh, they admit that they have 10 children and they're applying to a two or three bedroom apartment? So I would check with your attorney in your area. Local housing laws might have a um, per square foot or unit maximum occupancy limit. Some places don't. So in those cases, I would consult with an attorney. Um, that would help you to give that as the reason. It's not necessarily because they have children or a big family and that you're against that. It's just a health and safety issue. Urgencio asking, I know in New York City, you have to know if there are children under 10 for window guards. Um, also, minors can't be listed as responsible parties in the lease as occupants, but not the main tenants. So can we ask in person how many adults will be on the lease or living in the unit? Yes, uh, that's totally fine. You can ask that. I think New York City, as we all know, is usually a, a place where there are quite a few exceptions to some of the federal uh, rules. So I would say, yes, if minors um, can't be listed on the lease as responsible parties, 
that's okay, but they definitely should be listed as occupants just so that there is a record that they do reside uh, in the property. Okay, let's see what else do we have here. Latasha, if at the end of the lease damage is found from the emotional support animal, can you charge for damages since the pet fee cannot be charged? So yes, you can charge for damages. It would just be out of the general security deposit. So just because they're an emotional support animal doesn't mean that they can't damage the property and that you can't recover uh, those damages. So I certainly would um, still itemize that and deduct it from the security deposit. D. Simon, when you have a short-term summer rental like Memorial Day to Labor Day, how do you determine the amount of security deposit? The rent is usually significantly higher. Um, so yeah, I I would still you know check with an attorney to see what you can for a short-term rental. Um, but I would say the more the better, just so that if they are just staying for a holiday or I would say you know summer, right, a few months, um, you definitely want to make sure that you do have security deposit in place for that. Um, and I mean, people can still damage the rental just as much in three months as they can in 12, right? So it's still something that you can think about as if it were a long-term lease. Um, but I certainly would check in with your attorney just in case there is maybe a local law that might state that you can't ask for that much security deposit if it is under a certain number of months. Um, but if you can, I would. Uh, let's see here. Suniti, following up on the tenant disclosing emotional support cat after moving in, can he be given a move out notice for not disclosing it prior to move in? Um, so no, like if he puts in an emotional support request, then you cannot evict. Um, if you give them a notice because they haven't given you the request um, and then they provide you the request, then you have to rescind the notice. So at any point when they ask for the emotional support animal accommodation, it's at that point that you can no longer proceed with an eviction. And so um, that is pretty much the rule uh, all around. I would say uh, another thing to note is that just because they don't disclose it when they move in doesn't mean that they aren't allowed to disclose it later. Um, so even if it is after they moved in, that is still technically a valid request that you do have to consider. Ian, can you touch more on the last question from things to ask at a screening? Is there any additional requirements or accommodations? Okay, I think we answered that one in the Q&A. Nora, I have tenants who applied mom and daughter uh, never, the daughter never moved in, but the mom had a boyfriend and several grandkids. Should I change the lease to include the boyfriend and the grandchildren or just leave it? She pays rent on time, but I'm concerned about the kids because I pay for water and it's been sky high. Um, so in some areas you can charge more per, um, rental unit if you are billing for utilities. So a company that I would recommend contacting is livable. That's L I V A B L E. Um, they can let you know if, uh, and how much exactly you can charge in your area for X number of, uh, occupants. And they have a formula that they use um, and they'll be able to tell you exactly how much you can charge for that. I would put the boyfriend on the lease. He is no longer a guest. He is a long-term tenant and he's an adult. And so he should be party to the lease. Um, I would recommend getting that if you can. Okay. Can we ask for income tax returns from Patricia? Yes, you certainly can. Um, I would definitely recommend it if it's a self-employed individual. Yeah, Lisa, that financial ratio of three times the rent was used in the past uh, from banks, but the golden rule has changed over the years due to the financial changes of families. I agree. Uh, Nancy asking about debt to income ratio. That's certainly another ratio you could incorporate. Um, and it is up to you kind of to decide that, right? So cost of living varies quite a bit from place to place. And so you want to make sure that if you take what their total income is, you deduct the debt payments. So 
auto loan, student loan, whatever is left over, how much do you need that to be for it to be reasonable for them to pay the rent and the cost of living expenses? So it's sort of a calculation you have to do on your own, given your knowledge of your area and the cost of living um, and what you feel comfortable with. Nora, I have a tenant who has stayed for years with a $1,000 security deposit. Can I increase their security deposit to meet up with the current security deposits? So you can at least renewal. Uh, and again, I would talk to an attorney as to exactly how to do that. If you're in California, for example, I'm not sure if you can, but um, I think it, at the least renewal is when you can change any of the terms. So if they are on an annual lease, uh, certainly wait for that. If they're on month to month, then you should be able to draft up a change, but they do need to agree to it. So uh, just make sure whatever amendments you're making to the lease you're doing at the right time. Uh, and also see here, another question from Tina. Can we say that the property does not participate in section eight? It highly depends on where you are in the state of California, New York and Illinois. No, um, there may be other states and cities where that's not possible. Um, I would avoid it. It makes you a target really for fair housing lawsuits. If you aren't allowed to say that, certainly there are um, lawyers and uh, tenant actors, I would call them, that are out there specifically looking for that phrase in your rental listing so they can come after you. So I would discourage you from saying that um, unless you have ran it by an attorney. Woodland RV Park. Should I follow all these steps for even renting out an RV site in Colorado? We have a mixture of tenants. We have 42 RV sites, short-term, long-term, 12-month lease, uh, six units. So you have a big mix. Um, you may want to have different uh, requirements for different types of tenants. And that's okay as long as within that group of tenants, you are applying those rules all the same to those applicants. So if you have, okay, these are my list of requirements for short term. These are my list of requirements for long. These are my list of requirements for an RV versus a you know, home, then that should be fine. Um, I would though, you know, definitely look at what would make sense for all of those situations. Um, and following these steps does make sense, even if it is short term. I mean, even if like I was mentioning before, it's just a few months, you still want to collect that security deposit. You still want to go through all those things because they can still do just as much damage in three months as they can in 12, right? If you're renting to the wrong person. Um, so certainly I think it is worth it. I know it seems like overkill, but trust me, if you ever one day need or wish that you had done it, it will be too late. Uh, so I would recommend doing this before you have any issues, regardless of the length of the tenancy or the type. Uh, Kevin, depending on your rental, a uh, good guideline is one and a half the rent uh, that your state allows. Tenants have a habit of not paying last month's rent. Uh, so we leave half of rent for any damages, but most tenants um, can't come up with one and a half in first month. Yeah, it's true, Kevin. Um, you know, it, it, a lot of tenants think for some reason that the security deposit is the last month's rent when it's not, right? Um, so make sure you make that clear to them and you also factor that in when you're deciding how much of a security deposit you want to collect. Jeff asks, when using your application, so I think he's referring to the apply now uh, application link, do we get a complete copy of the application and the supporting documents provided? You absolutely do. So that link will ask them to fill in their information and also optionally they can upload their driver's license, W-2 pay stubs, bank statements. Um, so if you want them to upload those, I would let them know when you send them the application link. And then yes, you will get a copy of all of that and also all the information that they filled out. Uh, Litsa, can you elaborate on the estimate of your time? Yes. So uh, there is, you know, some places where you can charge for your time in terms of deducting for a security deposit or application fee. Um, that would be highly subjective. So be very careful with it, right? If you're not hiring somebody to do the work for you, how much is your time worth? Uh, certainly something worth discussing with an attorney so that you make sure you are charging something reasonable and legal for your area. 
Beverly, I stopped asking for security deposits. In Massachusetts, the legal process is long, yet I am beginning to reconsider this after a bad tenancy. Any suggestions? Yes, Massachusetts is another state that has a lot of rules around not only um, the security deposits, but also background checks, applications. Um, certainly, I would say if you're in Massachusetts, definitely talk to an attorney. Um, it's going to help you to have that security deposit, but it won't help if you're doing it wrong, right? It could hurt. Um, so I get why you're hesitant to even go through the process. Some places they do require you to put security deposits in a special account. You have to pay back interest. You have to have certain documentation that you provide the tenant. As long as you're filling in all those check boxes, you are okay. Um, but if you do it wrong, that's where you can get in trouble. So just make sure wherever you are that you are doing the security deposit correctly in your particular area um, so that you don't have to feel uncomfortable or not get one at all, which isn't ideal. Uh, Crystal, I have run into issues with eviction and verifying military status without the social. Is there a solution other than requiring the social? Unfortunately, there really isn't um, the eviction records. I, I don't know if most of you know this, but um, typically they don't have a date of birth or social attached to them, just a name and address. And so when we do an eviction search, um, we are using the social to find out all of the addresses they've ever lived at. And we're checking evictions at those specific addresses. So without the social, we don't have that list of addresses. And the only address we can check is the one that you provide us with. So it is a little bit limited when you do it that way. Um, so I would try to get the social when possible. The next best thing is just to get a current address so that you can verify that there were no evictions at that address or maybe also a previous one. Um, and that would probably be the best way to do it. Military status is also difficult to do without it. Um, and unfortunately though, you know, if you can't verify the status, then um, you, I would say check with the attorney to see what your rights are for declining that tenant if they are asking for, or any special sort of um, lease agreement clauses that might apply to military. All right, Lisa says, um, Charge them the fee for the home warranty if they cause damage only. Yeah, that's a good that's a good point. Um, I would still check in with an attorney to see if you can charge for those home warranty fees. Um, but certainly if it's not their fault, you know, maybe something that uh, you may not want to charge for. I have long term tenants whose security deposit is much lower than the current rent. Is it recommended to ask for updated security deposit in California? So we had a similar question like this earlier. Um, so check with your attorney, but I think you can update it when the lease renewal comes up. Jeffrey, is there a rule of thumb on carpet age and replacement? It's usually five to seven years. Um, some states have a specific number of years, uh, but I would say five to seven if there is nothing specified. Didi, how long do we need to retain uh, the application? So we already answered that one, two years. You need to request personal liability insurance on renters, not just renters insurance. And you need to have your own liability insurance if your coverage is so low that you can deal with lawsuits. So yes, absolutely, Litsa, uh, thank you. I said it earlier, but you said it very well here. Um, very good tips. So personal liability insurance on the renters, not just the renters insurance. A really good idea. Natalia uh, says, thank you uh, sincerely for another outstanding presentation. <laughs> thank you so much. I know some of you have to go. I see Paul had to leave. Um, what is the minimum or the highest limit for rental insurance? I'm not sure, actually. I would check in with some insurance companies and see uh, what they can quote you. We are going to be sending the recording, Natalia. Okay, do you have any recommendation for an insurance company to insure the interior of a condo? Mine just canceled our renewal because they are leaving state. So yes, I do have one. I'm gonna show you guys the screen one more time here. So if you go under the solutions tab again, by the way, lots of amazing resources under the solutions tab, okay? So please, please take a look here. We do have landlord insurance. This is not renter's insurance, okay? Landlord insurance. So this is for your particular insurance company, please fill out this form here. Um, a insurance agent will get back to you. They are a broker, so they're not representing a specific um, insurance 
company, they're representing dozens. And so they could find the best one in your state, give you lots of options. They'll give you a full report. Um, the company is called Insurance Hub. They are the brokers. Uh, we've been working with them for several years and uh, they are really, really good at just giving you lots of different options. So they'll find a way to give you a good rate and uh, you know a good match as far as coverage goes. Okay, let's see here. Okay, uh, Lisa, not sure if you covered this already. How do you know what is covered under the security deposit and what is not in the San Francisco Bay Area? Can you ask the tenant to pay for garden maintenance? So definitely if you're in San Francisco Bay, check with an attorney, but typically in most places you can charge a fee. You just have to disclose what that fee is and it wouldn't be part of the security deposit if it is for garden maintenance, um, but essentially it would be like a utility. So um, the company that I would recommend again is Livable. They do all kinds of utilities, not even just the traditional ones. If you have solar or if you have a gardener um, in some places, you can charge that as if it is a utility, as long as you put it in the lease agreement. So um, I would check with Livable or an attorney to find out what you can charge for um, landscaping or garden maintenance. D. Simon, uh, do you need to make changes to your homeowner's insurance if you rent a residence on an annual basis? Yes, you absolutely should. Homeowner's insurance is not going to be enough. It's not going to cover you in a lot of situations that might come up with a tenancy. So it's best, even if it is a single family home, to have a specific insurance that is for landlords. And I will say that if you are going through, let's say, um, I don't know, you have like a basic standard um, insurance and you know you're looking at um, adding on something for commercial they may not be the best fit so just because they're really great with your personal insurance doesn't mean that they would be good with multifamily or with rentals so i would still check with them but also insurance hub on our site because they specialize in rentals specifically so there might be better rates or better types of coverage that they offer um, rather than just going to the one that you might have for like auto insurance. They might not really know a whole lot about renter or, or how to do rental um, insurance. So definitely would check with them. Okay, Gloria, uh, yes, we are sending you a copy of the presentation tomorrow. Um, okay, Sam, I logged into the website. I wanted to print a free form for due rent, but it takes me to payment options. Um, you know, it shouldn't, uh, but what I'll do is I'll include it in the follow-up email tomorrow as just a PDF link, um, cause it should ask you if you want to log in or not. So, um, if you're, if you don't have an account, you have to create one for free, but you don't have to pay to have an account with us. Um, so it should be free, but I'll definitely check that out, uh, now that you brought it up and I'll be sure to just put it as a PDF. So you guys don't have to necessarily log in to get it. Um, and then let me look back at the Q&A, make sure I didn't miss anything else here. Rain, if someone moves in with a tenant later down the road, can we require an application to be filled out so we have the information on the new tenant, such as social security number? Yes, you absolutely can. I would include that in the lease agreement so that they are, understand that that is what happens when um, someone new moves in. Okay, so I think that answers all of the questions. Uh, thank you for sticking around. I do have one last poll question. Um, at the beginning of this presentation, we did look at Door Spots property management software. Um, they are the sponsors of this webinar. Their software actually does have a really great application feature as well. So it's a, another good way to collect the applications and have it all documented in one place. And then you can also use their software for rent collection, maintenance request, any kind of communications with the tenants. And um, it, it honestly has so many new features that I, I feel, you know, it is one of the most comprehensive property management softwares out there. Um, so if you are managing multiple units, that is going to be a really great way to do it. The rates are pretty reasonable. It starts at about, um, I believe, 30 for 35 units. It's, um, let me see, what was their rate again? So for 30, up to 35 units, it's $55 a month. But 
with the offer that they're doing for this webinar, it would be 20% off. Um, so about $11 off per month for your first year. Um, so I definitely would suggest giving that a try. Um, they also have a free trial as well if you just want to check it out and see how it works. Um, and it, it really can make your operations a lot more simple. So I would highly recommend taking a look at that. I'm going to go ahead and end that poll here. And then also just um, thank you all for sticking around. Again, I'm going to send you the full presentation, PowerPoint slides, all the resources we talked about, and also the recording. And I do hope that you will join us for some of our future webinars. As you leave, please take the exit survey. We are having a rental housing conference on October 16th in Long Beach, California. I would love to come meet you in person there. Uh, we are going to have a few hundred of our members coming to that and lots and lots of education all day. If you liked what you heard today, there will be basically the best of the best of our speakers there speaking. We'll have lots of uh, resources and networking time. Lunch is included. So if you can take a day in October for it, please come. I highly encourage you to. If you can't make it or if you're not in California, um, you don't want to come all the way out here. We do have a virtual version of it as well. So you can catch all of the conference online. Um, but there are definitely some perks to coming in person if you can make it. So I hope that you'll see you'll we'll see you there in some form or fashion. And that if you take the exit survey, please let me know if you're interested in coming. Um, I know it's still like four months away, but I definitely want to Make sure you all know about it soon. So, um, and with that said, I hope that uh, we will see you on the next webinar as well. And I hope you also have a great day. Thank you for sticking around.